Well, go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be here with you guys tonight. My name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here. If you've got a Bible, you can go ahead and open to the book of Luke, chapter 23. It's where we're going to be at tonight uh, as we continue our Son of God series looking at the Gospel of Luke and and what it tells us about Jesus. And as always, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to take one of the Bibles home with you today. We've got some in the chairs that are around you. You can just grab that and take it home as our gift to you. And if you're watching, from Parker or uh, our online campus. We're happy to have you as a part of our church as well. And if you need a Bible, we'd love to get you one. So if you're watching online, reach out so that we can connect you with the Word of God in that way. Uh, Hey, you know, as I was getting ready for this message, I was thinking about the power of words, and I was especially thinking about the power that words have to reveal character, especially in moments of difficulty and stress and tragedy. I was thinking about how words spoken in those moments tell us a lot about the character and nature of a person. And and I was thinking about how they're memorable as well. And and maybe you remember the words spoken by a president or one of our nation's leaders after a tragedy. You know, you, you, you watch and the whole nation looks to an individual, the leader, to say, hey, how are we to respond? How are we to move forward? And it's those words that are remembered throughout history, not the State of the Union addresses where everything's great and the world's at peace and it's just an update. We remember the moments of tragedy and what they reveal. Or maybe you remember a a little bit more personal thing. Maybe you had to share some difficult news. You had to confess something. Maybe you remember the words of a parent or someone significant in your life when you had to share something. It was a difficult moment. Maybe you remember the the words of grace and patience that were communicated to you, or more likely, perhaps, you remember the words of judgment, of impatience, of condemnation spoken, and the wounds that they created in your life. Or maybe on a more personal front, you think about the words that you've spoken in times of stress, in times of pain, in times of difficulty, And maybe you've had to go back and apologize for those things afterwards and confess that you were in the wrong with how you spoke to individuals. Either way, what comes out of our our mouth reveals who we are on the inside. It's that adage that when life squeezes us, what's on the inside comes out. And as we look at at the life of Jesus and as we approach Easter this coming weekend, I want us to look at probably the most difficult moments in Jesus' entire life and look at what came out of his mouth. What does that reveal about who he is and the character and nature that he had? And, and, and to do this, we're gonna look at the cross as he is, is living out the last final moments of his life, what comes out of, of him in terms of his character, his nature, who he is, and what does that reveal about him? And so to do that, we're going to look at John chapter, sorry, Luke chapter 23. Uh, I promise to remember what book we're in for this entire year. Uh, Luke chapter 23, we're going to start down in verse 32. I encourage you to follow along as we look at this. It says this, it says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there's also an inscription over him, saying, this is the king of the Jews. So here as Jesus is being mocked, as he's being ridiculed, as he's being made a joke of, in the midst of suffering and pain, we see that Jesus offers forgiveness. And probably the most well-known of his statements from the cross, Jesus uttered those words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And and this is such a shocking thing because you think about where he must be at in that that moment mentally as he's there physically suffering. He's got nails driven through his hands and his feet. He's there hanging in embarrassment and in pain after going through the entire night of being wrongly arrested, wrongly tried, beaten nearly to the point of death. And there he is on the cross, knowing his innocence, knowing that this it is all legally improper, but also knowing that his death is nearly approaching. 
He looks at those mocking him, making fun of him, judging him, and offers forgiveness. And this is so shocking to us because our natural response to being wrongly treated is, is vengeance. We want payback. If, if we're in his position, we start plotting revenge. You know, we take on the mindset of our favorite vigilante person. We start plotting what we're going to do to get them back. Because we want them to suffer and we actually want them to suffer more than we suffered because we want vengeance. But Jesus, he, also, he knows that this is, there's a better path forward. He knows that forgiveness is actually the currency that, that changes the world. And so there, in those simple words, he utters forgiveness. But this is more than just to the people that were gathered, that were surrounding the cross, looking at Jesus and these two criminals hanging there. It's more than just to the officials who hung him up there. Because th these words that have echoed throughout history offer forgiveness to us as well. See, we weren't present there at the hanging of Jesus on the cross we weren't false witnesses in his trial in the middle of the night. We didn't go and help identify him in the Garden of Gethsemane for arrest. The scripture says that we are all actually part of the reason that Jesus was crucified. Romans 3 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6 says that the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus went to the cross to, to be that death, to, to pay the punishment for the sin that we've created. As someone who is perfect and sinless, he stepped into the place of sin and punishment and death for us. And listen to Romans chapter five. It says, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for you and for me. So those words of Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, they apply to us as people who, who walk through life living in sin, knowing not what we do. As people who are broken and flawed, as people who go around hurting others and hurting ourselves, we are the people that Jesus died for. We are the people that he suffered for, we are the people that he was nailed to the cross for. And the beauty of that statement isn't just for that present moment, but for us as well. See, listen to Ephesians chapter one. It says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. So let me ask you today, are you living like the cross of Jesus brings forgiveness to your life? Not just general forgiveness, but real personal specific forgiveness for you. Are you living like that, the symbol of the cross and the event that Jesus had there shows that, that God loves and cares about you personally? Are you living like the cross is a reminder that, that Jesus suffered so that you could be in relationship to your creator? Or are you still seeing God as this, this guy that's just holding your bad deeds above your head? Because Jesus offers forgiveness. He went to the cross so that we could be forgiven. And the beauty of, of the power of God is displayed here that the cross goes from this worldwide symbol of hatred and violence and dominion to a symbol of love and forgiveness. It, it goes from an event of, of violence and hatred to an event of love and forgiveness. It was something meant to divide Jesus and his followers and yet it did the opposite. It reconciled people to God because of the power that was displayed there and the forgiveness that was offered. So Jesus offers forgiveness, but let's keep reading to see what else he utters there from the cross. Picking up in verse 39, it says this. It said, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, Jesus offers the people forgiveness, but then Jesus presents hope to those there as well, specifically to this man that was hanging next to him. 
And it's an interesting scene. There's these, these criminals that were there. They were guilty. They were justified in being there. They had earned their place on the cross very emphatically. And yet this man calls out for mercy. He, he calls out to be remembered when Jesus comes into his kingdom. And it makes me think of some other individuals throughout the biblical storyline that, that have those moments of wanting to be remembered. It makes me think of Joseph, this individual who also found himself wrongly accused and in prison. And he, he helps one of Pharaoh's uh, servants who is also in jail with him. And he says, hey, remember me when you go before Pharaoh that I might get out of here. But the book of Genesis says that he was not remembered and Joseph sat in that prison for two full years before that servant remembered Joseph. It makes me think of David's. As, as a young child, he was anointed the next king of Israel. This prestigious, amazing privilege to be saying, hey, you were the next king of God's chosen nation. And yet for approximately five years, he continues to wander the hills as a shepherd boy, wondering when this will happen, wondering when he will be remembered as the next king. Makes me think of Abraham in the Old Testament, the, the one that God said, hey, your descendants will be numerous like the stars in the sky. You will be the, the, the origin of my chosen people, and yet he was childless. And months turn into years, years turn into decades, and he and his wife find themselves childless. You had to think that, that Abraham was like, Will God remember me? Will God remember that promise? And God is good. He did come through. He did fulfill that promise. And maybe you've even had a moment of, of, of a remember me moment of God, hey, remember what I'm doing here. Remember my faithfulness. Remember how I'm serving you. Please remember what I'm doing. But this criminal here, he's hanging on the cross and, and you can't skip by the humanity of it. You can't hear the words of this criminal and not feel his position. He is not getting out of this situation alive. He's in the final moments of his life. He knows there's nothing he can do to change the outcome of this at this point. And so he does the only thing that he knows he can do and he cries out for mercy. And the words there are, are dripping with, with faith and belief in Jesus, but also that cry for mercy and help. And what he hears back are not words of dismissal or condemnation or even questioning from Jesus, but he hears hope. Today, you will be with me in paradise, Jesus tells him. This, this beautiful promise that, that the end of his life would be the beginning of something beautiful because he had faith in the savior of the universe. And Jesus didn't just see a criminal hanging there, but he saw someone who believed, someone who had faith. So Jesus spoke into his life. He spoke hope and truth. And that same hope is available for you and I today. See, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And the, the knowledge and truth of eternal life can give us hope. It can give us hope knowing that the future is promised, the future is good, the future is beautiful for us. See, we may not find ourselves nailed to a wooden cross, but we may find ourselves in moments struggling to find hope. We may be in moments where we wonder how life could get better, how, how the news cycle around us could possibly shift from negative to positive. We may find ourselves in, in times where we wonder how we can overcome the consequences for our decisions, how we can dig ourselves out of the hole that we've made for ourselves. It may be even wondering how the next life could be any better than this one. And that's where the, the promise that Jesus shares with this man on the cross comes into our life. Because when we remember the hope of eternity, it changes everything. Listen to Revelation chapter one as it describes the hope of heaven. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be the, no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain any longer for the former things have passed away. 
And he who was seated on the throne saying, behold, I am making all things new. He said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. I love that last statement. Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. The hope of heaven is trustworthy and true for our life. It can change how we view our present situation because when we know the outcome, it changes how we view the moment. Think about watching, if you're a sports guy, watching a game when you've already seen the box score and you're watching a replay of the game, those, those you know, fourth quarter tight moments, those tight plays aren't as stressful because you already know the outcome. If you watch scary movies, but you've already seen it a few times, it's not scary because you know the outcome. And for us as Jesus followers, the same is true for our life. The outcome is secured. The outcome is an eternity in heaven, a place without mourning or crying or pain or tears. The, the outcome is secured so we can have hope in that. But also we have hope because Jesus is with us today. And I think this is sometimes something that, that we downplay. We, we talk, oh, as Christians, we have hope because you know, when we die, eternity is secured for us, but that can leave us wondering, okay, but what about right now? I don't wanna die to get things better. And to, to understand that, we come back to places like John 14, where Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans to figure out life on your own. He says, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit, the helper to be with you. So when we step into a life-changing relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into our life to help us, to teach us, to guide us, to support us, to bring power and assistance into our life. So see, knowing who God is, knowing the future that he has for us, knowing how he's working in our life in the present brings us hope. And that was all displayed and explained by Jesus there as he offers hope to the criminal hanging next to him. But there's one more statement that we need to look at as the final moments of Jesus' life tick down. Verse 44 of Luke 23 says, it was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. See, in Jesus' last moments of life, his last statement from the cross, Jesus models surrender. He models surrender to the will, to the plan, to the path of the Father. And see, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago when we looked at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. But it wasn't just that day leading up to the cross that Jesus was living in surrender. It was his whole life his whole life was a practice of surrendering to the Father's will. See, he, he, he submitted and agreed to a plan that was based on the Father's will, a plan that they would have him being born into an impoverished family in this sad little community that was made fun of and diminished. He submitted to a plan that would have him working most of his life in manual labor as a carpenter. He submitted to a plan that would have him spending three years ministering to people, teaching, all the while being mocked and discredited and threatened. He submitted to a plan that would have him falsely accused and arrested and tortured. As we continue working through it, he would submit to a plan that had him hanging on the cross in pain and agony and suffering and would culminate with him taking the punishment for the sins of the entire world. Something that he fully understood the weight of, which is why he uttered those words in the garden, but something that you and I can never fully grasp. All the while submitting to the Father's plans. And so here, his last statement of his life on earth here, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And as I was studying for this, I actually discovered that, that there's some significance here. See, this is a quote of, of Psalm 31, 5, which says, into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. 
But see, there's, there's more than just that being a quote because devout Jews in that time would quote that as part of their nightly prayers. They would quote Psalm 31, five as they went to bed saying, into your hands I commit my spirit. And so Jesus likely grew up every night going to sleep, uttering those words as a prayer to his father, as a, as a theoretical statement of trust and submission and surrender. But now he uttered them publicly as an act of literal surrender of his life. As, as an act of saying, Father, I'm giving everything to you as the culmination of my life here on earth. And he surrendered this. He surrendered his life as a way to, to make it possible for us to be reunited to the Father, but also as a model that we are to surrender as well. That our life is to be one of constant surrender to the Father's plan. So today, as we begin the, the week approaching Easter, as we think on, on the events of Jesus on our behalf, let me ask you, are you surrendering your life to God? Are you living in surrender to the God of the universe? Let me ask you a few questions with that. Will you surrender your spiritual life to God? Will you surrender who you are spiritually? Will you step into a relationship with Jesus? Will you live in a way that not just your words but your actions show that you believe that God is the most important thing in your life? Will you surrender your desire to control your life, to control your relationships, your finances, to control your kids, your job, your activities? Will you surrender that desire to the God who can control everything and who can lead your life better? Will you surrender your life in the way you define how to live? See, will you look at God's word and say, God, you define how I'm to live my life, how I'm to treat people, how I'm to approach situations? Because we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God, which teaches us what to believe and how to live. So will you surrender to the will of God in that way? Will you surrender your future to God? You may have plans and ambitions and dreams and hopes and, and you may think that you need to do your path in order to make those things happen and if you start following God that, that some of your dreams and ambitions aren't going to happen the way you want. So will you surrender your future to the God of the universe? Finally, will you surrender your priorities to God? We live in this constant state of aligning and arranging priorities, everything from, from our schedules and, and our, our chore lists and how we maintain different things and where we go to, to work and the, the chores around the house and all these different things. We're constantly arranging the priorities of our time and our attention. Will you surrender that to the God of the universe and say, hey, God, you are going to get the biggest section of my time, of my focus, of my attention are you going to live and surrender to God? Maybe we need to be uttering the words like Jesus, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Instead of maybe, though, ending our day like first century Jews would, would end their day, maybe we start our day with those words. Saying, Father, into your hands I commit my day, I commit my priorities, I commit my energy, I commit my focus, I commit everything to you today to the Father. See, I hope that as we look at the words of Jesus, you would understand the forgiveness, the hope that he can bring. That his life squeezed him as the world uh, weighed down on him with pain and suffering and difficulty and stress. There wasn't a gotcha. There wasn't a, a, a viral moment from Jesus of him breaking and, and, and chewing someone out. There was only forgiveness and hope and surrender that came out of his mouth. And I hope today that the words of Jesus would change how you see life. I hope that the words of Jesus would, would help you understand the forgiveness that is possible, the forgiveness for past sins and the, the forgiveness for anything in the future. I pray that the words of Jesus would bring hope knowing that our future is secured, that Jesus wins, that the hope of heaven is real but also the hope we have that God is with us today. The Holy Spirit is walking with us that is active and living in our world with us. And I hope that, that you would see Jesus' act of surrender and that you as well 
would live a life of surrender to God the Father, that your life, your actions, your priorities, your words, your focus would all echo the words of Jesus there. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And as you surrender to God, I pray that you would find forgiveness and hope and life. Let's pray today. God, we thank you that, that Jesus came to save us, that you love us even while we were still sinners. God, that, that verse is easy to quote, but hard sometimes to fully grasp the significance of. That even as we were living as people fully opposed to you, fully pushing back on your plans and your instructions and your guidance, God, you stepped into human history with forgiveness, with hope, with grace, with peace. God, as people who knew not what they do, you came to forgive us. So I pray today that we would fully understand the forgiveness that is available, that we would step into a place of hope by trusting in your son Jesus as our savior. And I pray that as we would do that, you would help us to surrender not just our spiritual life, but all of our life over to you. And that we would find life and peace in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.